Hi, today I'm going to talk about vaginal discharge in children. Now it's normal after puberty to have a vaginal discharge and for adult women, for example, it is normal to have a vaginal discharge. In children, however, this is not strictly normal. I'm going to go through the causes for vaginal discharge in children, most of which are innocent, but one of which is potentially very serious and I will discuss that at the end. So vaginal discharge is one of the most common reasons that girls see a paediatric gynaecologist like myself. And the most common cause is a condition called vulvovaginitis. Now vulvovaginitis means infection and inflammation of the vulva and vagina. It is extremely common in children and I will explain why. There are three reasons. The first is the anatomy. Now, in little girls, the anatomy of the vulva predisposes to infection going up into the vagina. The first reason is that the location of the vulva is very close to the bottom or the anus. So there's a tiny gap across which is very easy for bugs to go and climb up into the vagina and cause an infection. The second reason is that the labia or lips of the vulva are small and underdeveloped because there are no hormones, no estrogen, which is what is responsible for development of the labia. And therefore, they often do not meet in the midline. And meeting in the midline in adult women forms a mechanical barrier to infection going up. The other mechanical barrier is the presence of pubic hair. And pubic hair, of course, is absent in prepubertal children. That forms a mechanical barrier in adults, again, making it more difficult for bugs to enter the vagina. The other group of causes, or the second group of causes, is physiology, or I guess the hormones and the functions of girls before puberty. Now, because, as I mentioned before, there's no estrogen, that means that the vaginal tissues are more susceptible to infection. They are thinner. Also, there is absence of the bug called lactobacilli. So lactobacilli are organisms which normally live in the vagina of adult women. Their growth is encouraged by the presence of estrogens and they cause the vagina to be slightly acidic and therefore quite inhospitable to infections. Little girls, no estrogen, no lactobacilli, it's not acidic, therefore it's a very easy environment in which bugs grow. The third category is behavior. So girls who are, you know, young children, um, their hygiene isn't exactly on point at that age, many of whom have recently been potty trained. They're going to nursery and they're responsible for their own vulval hygiene, for example, after they have a wee or after they have a poo. And as we know, girls need to be taught to wipe from front to back. So the vulva backwards towards the bottom and then the paper disposed of. That scenario isn't always perfect, as you can imagine, in three-year-olds. Um, so that predisposes to bugs going kind of in the wrong place. Secondly, hand washing isn't the best. Um, and therefore, for example, it's quite often that these girls get vulvovaginitis or an attack when they have a respiratory tract infection, like a cold or a runny nose, because there's a lot of sneezing and then they might scratch the vulva and therefore the bugs get transferred. And for this reason, the most common bugs when we do swaps of the infections are often bugs from the respiratory tract or from the bottom because they're transferred. The last uh, behavior is um, that of Completely normal behavior for children, squatting in sand pits, this kind of thing. And that, again, opens the, the vulva a bit. Um, and that can easily result in uh, infection and grime dirt going up into the vagina. So 
Those are the main causes, all of which are innocent. The symptoms of vulvovaginitis are usually soreness of the vulva. It may be quite red and a discharge. The discharge is often quite distressing, not so much for the children, but often for the parents. It can be quite copious and it can be quite offensive. It is important to mention here that although occasionally some bleeding may be associated with vulvovaginitis, particularly if there's itching and breakage of the skin, if there is any bleeding, then that should not be ascribed to vulvovaginitis before further investigation. That bleeding should be viewed as pre-pubertal vaginal bleeding and that needs to be investigated in a completely different manner because there are several more serious causes for pre-pubertal vaginal bleeding. I will discuss that in another video. The main treatment for vulvovaginitis is patience and waiting because we know that the main causes for vulvovaginitis are the girl's age and the lack of estrogen and the lack of development and her behaviours, all of which will change over time towards puberty. So as, can, as you can imagine, anatomically, the vulva will develop, the space between the vulva and the anus will expand a bit, she will develop hair, the labia will increase in size and meet in the midline, and these will therefore decrease anatomical risks. In terms of physiology, she will start to produce estrogens, and I'm talking long before proper puberty, long before period start, she starts to produce small amounts of estrogens, and that will change the environment inside the vagina to make it a little more hostile to infections and therefore decrease the risk of infection. And lastly, uh, in terms of hygiene, of course, this will improve with, with time as she gets older and is taught and learns uh, vulval hygiene. Her behaviors also will improve, hand washing will improve, um, and you know, time spent in sand pits will decrease with time. The other treatments are mainly supportive, for example, uh, barrier creams can be used, um, nappy creams can be used if the vulva is sore, uh, barrier creams and emollients can be used as well, such as hydromol ointment, which can be applied. Some lifestyle modifications that can be undertaken to decrease the risk include wearing cotton knickers at all times, apart from when sleeping, when ideally, Sleeping without knickers uh, can decrease the risk. Avoiding tight clothing or multiple layers of clothing unless absolutely necessary. Everybody says limit bubble baths, which, um, yeah, I think that's a little bit harsh on, on, on little girls because they do enjoy a bubble bath. Um, but if we have them less frequently, then uh, it's less likely that she gets this uh, problem in a recurrent manner. It's important to note that the infections that girls get that cause vulvovaginitis, it isn't one long infection. Often parents will come along with their three or four year old to say she's had this infection, she's had this discharge for two years. And actually, that's usually not the case. What happens is the infection ascends into the vagina and usually the girl will clear the infection for herself so the discharge changes or stops, then of course, her age hasn't changed, her anatomy hasn't changed, her hormones haven't changed, so um, she gets another infection. So usually it's a sequence of infections and between these infections, the girl clears the infections herself. So for this reason, we don't routinely treat with antibiotics because of course we have to be careful with antibiotics because we don't want to cause resistance uh, in organisms and it's a little bit pointless to treat repeatedly with antibiotics when she's going to get you know she may get another attack anyway because her anatomy her hormones etc haven't changed so for that reason the treatment is mainly supportive in terms of investigation 
usually uh, a clinical examination is adequate where we, um, of course, we always have examine the abdomen first. We look at the vulva and we look to see if there's any discharge, any blood. We may take a swab if there's discharge present at the time. We may take a swab and send it off. The other possibility causing vaginal discharge is the presence of a foreign body. Now, the most frequent foreign body is usually actually a piece of tissue paper, although we always think of things like Lego or beads or toys. It's usually just a little piece of toilet paper that's made its way up into the vagina. That can cause irritation of the vaginal walls and absolutely can cause a vaginal discharge. What can be a telltale sign of the presence of a foreign body is that foreign bodies are almost always associated with a little bit of bleeding. But as I mentioned before, if there is bleeding, then that needs to be investigated in its own right anyway. So that takes away from the pathway of vaginal discharge, as it were, into the bleeding before puberty pathway. And in that pathway, a foreign body would absolutely be uh, diagnosed, investigated, and removed. So the, the last cause for uh, vaginal discharge in children is the possibility of a genital infection or a sexually transmitted infection. And obviously a careful, sensitive history is taken from every girl who has a vaginal discharge. And if the discharge is prolonged, recurrent, very malodorous, funny in colour, or if there are any suspicious circumstances on history or examination, then certainly a swab, a vulval swab, should be taken. A vaginal swab should never be taken in a child who is awake because the hymen is exquisitely tender. That means extremely painful. And it runs the risk of turning the child off of examinations in the future, smear tests, gynecologists. So we never ever do a vaginal swab in a child who is awake. If that swab or if circumstances are suspicious for a sexually transmitted infection, then that is a serious safeguarding issue and that should be escalated along safeguarding pathways. However, I'm delighted to say that this is rare, but the usual cause of vaginal discharge is innocent infections from bugs on the nose and throat or the bottom. The last thing I'd say is that the often hidden agenda or hidden worry of parents is that of fertility in children who have a vaginal discharge or vulvovaginitis. And the good news is that the infections that little girls get are different from those that adults get, generally speaking. And therefore, routine, common vulvovaginitis infection is not associated with fertility issues in the future. A very, very, very important point that I must make before the end of this video is almost every child I see with a vaginal infection or vulvovaginitis has been treated often several times for thrush, including a four-year-old who was prescribed a pessary when that was inserted. After seeing that, I became particularly motivated to teach and train parents, GPs, other doctors, that although thrush infection is extremely common 
post-puberty and in adult women extremely common. By and large, little girls don't get thrush. So thrush infection is extremely rare in children. Again, because estrogen plays a role in susceptibility to thrush infection. So for example, women are more susceptible to thrush infection when, for example, they're on the combined oral contraceptive pill or when they are pregnant, where these are high estrogen states and makes them more susceptible to thrush. Little girls, as I repeat over in Hofer, don't have any estrogen, so they're not as susceptible to thrush. So by and large, they do not get thrush. Now, of course, never say never in medicine. And clearly, if a child has severe uncontrolled diabetes, she may get thrush, or she is severely immunocompromised, she may get thrush, that is true. But a well pre child, it is very unlikely that her discharge is due to thrush. So she doesn't need treatment and it doesn't work. Well, thank you for listening. I hope that this has been useful because this is such a common, common, common condition that I see that really provokes anxiety and stress in parents. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. And of course, please join us on my Facebook page, Gynecology Girl Talk, where we discuss all things gynae that involves children and adolescents. Thank you for watching.